Today, we start our story in England and finish in Canada. So sit back as we go to the late 19th century. Reginald Birchall was born on the 25th of May, 1866, in the northern English town of Accrington, which is about 23 miles north of the city of Manchester. He was the youngest son of the Reverend Joseph Birchall, who was a rector of a local church. His father had been educated at Oxford University and was keen that all of his children should receive a good education. Reginald spent the first 12 years of his life being educated at home before his father sent him to board at the very well respected Rosal School. He proved to be a good scholar and enjoyed being with other pupils and prided himself on doing well in his classes. His time at the school, however, was cut short as just over a year after he started at Rosal, his father died and Reginald was sent to study at a less expensive school 225 miles away in the southern town of Reading. He spent the next five years at the school, but the educational standards were not as high as his father would have wanted or his previous school had strived to achieve, and the young man started to neglect his studies. He seemed to prefer to spend time in public houses rather than in the classroom. Reginald hoped to follow in his father's footsteps and study at Oxford University, but in 1884 he failed the university entrance exam and had to wait until 1885 to retake it. The second time he passed and entered Lincoln College, Oxford. When his father's estate was settled, Reginald had inherited £4,000, which was to be held in trust until his 25th birthday. This meant that while he was studying at Oxford, he would not yet have come into the money. Nevertheless, he was a resourceful young man and managed to live well beyond his means. This meant that he fell heavily into debt and with pressure from his creditors to pay, young Reginald decided to sell his inheritance and pay all the money he owed. He managed to receive £3,000 for it and although he was able to pay off his debts, he was left with very little money or collateral to borrow against and soon afterwards he left university without completing his studies. After leaving Oxford, he worked in a few places but nothing kept his interest for very long and in 1888 he secretly married Florence Stevenson who was the daughter of an elderly railway executive. Florence had come from a very comfortable and stable background and marrying Reginald meant that she was thrown into a world of debt and deceit. He was living beyond his means and was starting to amass more creditors. Reginald knew that he could not continue with his cycle of borrowing and spending, so in the autumn of 1888, the couple decided to leave their creditors and their way of life behind and start a new life in Canada. He invested £500 into what he thought was a small estate near Woodstock in southwestern Ontario. But when he arrived in Canada, he discovered that he had actually purchased a small farm. A new life also meant a new name, and he introduced him and his wife as Lord and Lady Somerset. Life in Canada, however, was difficult for Reginald. The winter was extremely cold and it was very different to the city life he had been used to. His wife would spend the days reading and it did not take long for the couple to decide that this way of life was not for them. And in the spring of 1889, after six months in Canada and with many unpaid bills, the couple returned to England and reverted back to the name Mr and Mrs Birchill. They went to live with Florence's father and Reginald tried his best to hold down employment. He managed to secure a position as an advertising executive for a photography company in London's New Bond Street. But as more companies were emerging and competing in the same market, his employer cut back on staff and Reginald was again out of work. Reginald had always wanted to make easy money without really having to work for it. 
And then he received a tip on a horse named Sam Foyne that was running in the famous race, the Epsom Derby, which would take place in June 1890. The tip had come from a very trusted and credible person who was associated with the horse racing world and Reginald thought that this could be the answer to all of his problems. All he would have to do was place a very large bet and if the horse won, he would receive lots of money to pay off his creditors and start to enjoy a comfortable life with his wife. There was only one issue with his plan and that was he didn't have any money with which to place a large bet on a horse and was unable to get any credit. Not being a person who was going to be denied by not having any money, he devised a scheme to enable him to raise capital. He placed an advertisement in a London newspaper proclaiming to be the owner of a farm in Canada who was looking for a partner to buy into the business for £500. He then planned to bet the money on the Epsom Derby take his partner to Canada, wait until the race was run and then pay back the £500 of interest out of his winnings. The advert received a few interested parties, but Reginald eventually reached agreements with two young men. The first was named Fred Benwell, who was from Cheltenham and the son of Colonel Benwell. The second was Douglas Pelly, who was the son of Reverend Pelly from Saffron Walden in Essex. Douglas Pelly paid Reginald £170 as a first instalment towards the 500, but Fred Benwell took a more cautious approach and said that he would not invest until he had seen the farm. This was not the best outcome for Reginald, but he was not to be deterred, and on February the 5th, 1890, along with his wife and his two investors, Fred Benwell and Douglas Pelly, Reginald boarded a ship and set sail from Liverpool, bound for New York. The quartet arrived nine days later, on February the 14th. After resting in New York, they all took the train to Buffalo, arriving on February the 16th. The two investors were very keen to see the farm, which was about two hours by train, once they had crossed the border into Canada. There was a complication, as Florence announced that she would not go to the farm until improvements had been made to make it more comfortable for her. So concerned about her being left alone, it was decided that Reginald would go to the farm with Fred and Douglas would stay in Buffalo to accompany Florence. Early the next day, on February the 17th, 1890, Reginald and Fred left to the hotel and boarded the great trunk train bound for Eastwood, a station just east of Woodstock. When the train arrived at Eastwood, the two men got off and headed for the farm. It is unclear if Reginald knew exactly where he was going, but they eventually headed up in a heavy wooded area called Blenheim Swamp. Suddenly, Reginald produced a revolver and at very close range, fired two shots at young Fred Benwell. He then removed the labels from all the dead man's clothing and took his wallet. Convinced that he had removed all the evidence of identification from his victim, Reginald left Fred's body in the swamp and made his way back to Buffalo. That evening, Reginald arrived back at the hotel where he was met by the other investor, Douglas Pelly, who was anxious to ask Fred about the farm. But when he did not arrive, he asked Reginald what had happened to the young man. Reginald told him that Fred wanted to stay on the farm. The next day, Reginald, Florence and Douglas all left Buffalo and moved into a hotel in Canada. They could not go far as they had to wait for their bags to clear customs. Reginald then started to behave somewhat oddly. He took Douglas to a few places. First, they went to Niagara Falls and he encouraged him to move very close to the side of the viewing area and look down at the water. Douglas, thinking he was in danger of falling, quickly retreated Reginald then took the young man to Niagara Falls Suspension Bridge. He explained that this was the world's first working railway suspension bridge and was an amazing piece of engineering. But again, when the two gentlemen arrived, Reginald was encouraging the young man to get very close to the edge as if he wanted harm to come to him. Later that day, Reginald announced to Douglas and Florence that he had received a message from Fred 
saying that he was returning to London and requesting that his luggage be sent to the Fifth Avenue Hotel in New York. On the same day, Thursday the 20th of February 1890, he wrote to Fred's father, Colonel Benwell, informing him that his son was very happy with the farm and had signed a deed of partnership. He requested that Colonel Benwell send the agreed £500 to conclude the deal. The next day, Friday the 21st of February, Douglas Pelly was browsing a newspaper when he was startled to read that a body had been found by two local farmers in Blenheim Swamp. The article was accompanied by a picture of the unfortunate man and he immediately thought that it looked remarkably like Fred Benwell. He ran to Reginald and showed him the article. At first, Reginald assured the young man that the picture was of someone else and that Fred was on his way to New York. But they decided that in order to eliminate any doubt, Douglas would travel to New York to see if Fred was in the Fifth Avenue Hotel and Reginald and Florence would go to Paris, Ontario to see if the body was, in fact, Fred Benwell. When the couple arrived at the mortuary, they were met by Detective John Wilson Murray, who was heading up the investigation. The detective had been unable to identify the victim despite a thorough examination of the body, but he had noted that all the labels on the deceased clothing had been removed. When searching the area, however, the police had found a cigar holder with the inscription FWB, which they believed to belong to the deceased. Reginald confirmed that the body was indeed Fred Benwell, but informed the detective that he knew very little about him and that he only met him on the ship while travelling to New York. Detective Murray continued to question Reginald, who confirmed that he had last seen Fred near Niagara Falls and made the point of telling him that the young man had arrived with a fair amount of luggage, some of which he had left at the hotel. When Detective Murray had finished speaking to Reginald, he thought that his story was not completely true and considered him someone to be further investigated. So he contacted the police in Niagara Falls and asked them to keep an eye on him. The following day, Douglas Pelly returned from New York and that evening, Detective Murray arrived in Niagara Falls. He interviewed Douglas and after the interview, he arrested Reginald Birchall. Detective Murray had arrested Reginald as he did not want him to leave Canada before he had had the opportunity to further investigate the case. But he also knew that he needed to find more evidence that he had committed the crime. The police then searched Fred and Reginald's luggage, where they found evidence that concurred with Douglas Pelly's statement that the two men had known each other long before they left England. Douglas Pelly had also told the detective that Reginald and Fred had travelled together to the farm on the 17th of February on the Grand Trunk train. The police then interviewed the conductor of the train who remembered the two men. They also managed to find passengers who travelled in the same carriage and who stated that both men had left the train at Eastwood Station. Another witness stated that he had seen the two men near the swamp and a local farmer came forward and said that he heard two revolver shots at around one o'clock on February the 17th. Other witnesses told the police that they had seen Reginald at the station on his return journey and one man who saw him said he had previously known him as Lord Somerset. It seemed that Reginald's movements on February the 17th, 1890 had been established and although the evidence may have been circumstantial, the Canadian authorities thought it was compelling enough to charge Reginald Birchall with the murder of Fred Benwell. The trial started on the 22nd of September 1890 and amassed press attention not only in Canada but across the United States and Europe. The British press were especially fascinated with the case as the accused and the victim were both from prominent families. The defence claimed that the evidence was all circumstantial and that the timeline was not correct as the defendant could not have left the train at Eastwood, walked to the swamp, committed the crime and walked back again in the time frame suggested by the prosecution. The prosecution however showed the court that the time frame was correct and that the defendant would have had more than enough time to have walked the four miles to the swamp, 
commit the terrible crime and walk four miles back. They also produced many witnesses who saw Reginald on the train. The prosecution also produced a letter that had been sent by the accused to the victim's father, Colonel Benwell. The letter claimed that Fred had signed a deed of partnership and requested that the Colonel send the agreed £500 to conclude the deal. The letter was not dated, but the envelope had a postmark of the 20th of February, which was three days after the young man had been murdered. When the jury was sent out to consider the case, they returned after only one and a half hours to find the defendant, Reginald Birchall, guilty, and the judge sentenced him to hang. His loyal wife, Florence, proclaimed her husband's innocence, but while in prison, awaiting his fate, Reginald was approached by a Canadian newspaper who wanted to print his story. He knew that there was little chance of a reprieve, so thinking that any money made by him writing his account of his life would help his wife in the future, he wrote his story. Some important facts were undoubtedly left out, but his writings were a fascinating tale of his life, and it was apparent that he considered himself to be an English gentleman. On November the 14th, 1890, in the Woodstock prison yard, Reginald Birchall was hanged. Between Reginald's arrest and the trial, the horse race for Epsom Derby took place on the 2nd of June, 1890. It was won by the horse named San Foyne. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As per usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I will see you in the next brief case.